Hey, welcome back to The Craft, where we explore what we're learning about the creative process. We are here today in person, literally just <laughs> fist bump. We're here, special episode, and really excited about today. We're talking about cultivating artistic taste. How do you revise your work? How do you know what work is excellent? Where does that taste come from? And tell me more, like what, this was your idea. So what else do you want to kind of cover today? Yeah, I think I want to bring our attention to like a central tension and maybe the tension, or we could pose it as a question. When you're revising, you have to make all sorts of decisions. What is working? What's not working? What do I keep? What do I get rid of? And we kind of instinctually say things like, oh, this isn't working. You know, I need to throw this out. But I'm curious to say, what's going on there? I mean, you could describe it as a gut reaction. You could describe it as all sorts of things. But we just kind of have this sense that, oh, that drum, that snare's wrong, or that sentence is is wrong. We've got this sense that, like, we're always evaluating our work. And so the question about taste, for me, is what are the sorts of things that allow us to make those evaluative judgments while we revise? Because it's easy to say, okay, you need to revise, but how do we do that? And I think that's maybe a thing that we can kind of dig in today. One of our creative first principles, the third one or the second, is revise. And so how do we revise? What sort of processes or frameworks or ideas or paradigms help us decide what's working and is not working. And so one of the big distinguishing features that I want to kind of tease out today, and maybe you could respond to this, um, and I'll, I'll be brief about it. There's a tendency to think there are just preferences within artistic worlds. I prefer listening to this type of music. You prefer listening to a different kind of music, genres. And truly, there are different preferences. Some people prefer, let's say in prose writing, a ornate and complex sentence structure. Some people prefer really streamlined, bare-bones syntax. And there can be preferences. But there's a tendency to think there are just preferences, that there are not artistic kind of principles that can guide our choices, because we actually can, I think, and because we do this so often, say, this is working or not working, or this is a bad example of what I was trying to do, and this is a good example of what I'm trying to do. If there's no sense of we can go beyond preferences to better, this is better than it used to be, I mean, that's the whole idea of revision, that we can make it better. So the question becomes, how do I know how to make it better? And this is where I see developing your taste becomes so important. And so I would, I would love to talk more about taste and those sort of things, but any responses kind of off the bat with what you're thinking about with either one, what's going on when we say, oh, that's not working, like what's happening there, or two, how are we trying to determine what's better or worse? They're kind of the same question, but are you, are you picking up on that? Yeah, so the first one, how do we uh, make those decisions kind of in the, minute mo or the minute decisions of like, oh, this is working or this isn't working. This sentence works. This sentence doesn't work. It's kind of, it's so tough to answer because it feels really subjective. Like what my, what I think is really cool, you might think is cheesy, for example. And so I think that does get into this bigger conversation of having good taste. And that's what a lot of, uh, when it comes to making things in general, people say it's not uh, what you keep, it's what you leave out that sometimes makes something great. I've heard that talked about in the product world. Maybe Steve Jobs said that or something, but, you know, so that idea of reduction and saying no to things, it's saying no to a thousand things when you could do all of them and saying, you know, we're going to do this thing. Like there's a, a decision and it comes back to taste. And I think in a lot of ways where my mind's going is, your taste kind of goes back to your goals and your your the why behind your what you're doing. Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. And perhaps a helpful distinction would be between taste and preference. Because I think yeah. there are tons of things we prefer that are just 
equal, right? I may prefer spicy food. You may prefer, uh, we're throwing all sorts of crazy metaphors around, but there's preferences. But then I think taste is trying to get at something a little bit different. It's that there can actually be something that's not just, I prefer this drum kit to this other one, but actually one of those drum kits was better. It made this song a more cohesive, unified, effective, whatever kind of uh, adjective you want to give it, that there was actually like a right choice between the drum kits. And that's when I think you move beyond preference to taste, which makes some people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I can see. I mean, yeah, but there's just so much. I hear what you're saying. Like, basically, it's kind of comes down to like, what is the objective good? Basically, is that what you're kind of getting at? Like, is there an objective like, like, let's take two versions of like an A-B test, like two versions of the same song, right? So you have version A that uses these sounds and you have version B that uses these other sounds. You play them back to back. It's like, are you trying to say that A is objectively better than B and that's the kind of argumentation or is it more like, you know, because of like, I guess beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Like who's the beholder here? Okay. You know, like, are you saying from the perspective of, like listeners or the audience there, or from the perspective of the creator, I guess. I I'm, I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a problem at you okay. because I love that you said you you cut right to the the question. If we've got the A B choice, two versions of the song. If we decide that there is no better version of the song, there's just the one that you prefer. If we take that as our principle, and I'm here, you know, note I'm stealing from the philosopher Roger Scruton. He says, if there are just things that we prefer, then I look at some things and you look at other things and we can't say anything meaningful about them. Why are Rembrandt's paintings in museums and not something else? Is it just because more people prefer him? Or is there something valuable in his work? Did he do something that was noteworthy, that was remarkable, that is not simply people prefer to look at it, but it's actually something that is better than a lot of other artwork. Now, this doesn't mean that we can, you know, people are afraid of this idea of taste because they're like, oh, it's just for the people in the ivory tower who say this is lowbrow art and this is highbrow art, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it is an interesting thing to think about if we've got that A-B choice and our principle is only, well, you prefer A and I prefer B. Okay, that may be true, but even if we prefer different things, could one of them be a better song? And so now you open up this whole conversation about what makes a better song. Are there principles in music that you need to hit? Or let's maybe let's talk about song maps for a second, right? I think the idea of Salmax in some way is trying to distill some of the elements and features and attributes that make songs popular or make them an experience that we want to go back to. I'm going to throw that your way. You can take it any which way. Gosh, there's so many directions you could go because I think the conversation, it's, it's, it, it, we, there's a temptation to go very philosophical with it. Like, is there an objectively better thing? Sure. Or you can take just more of a pragmatic route. Like, maybe kind of like what's your definition of success? Like, is success being, like, the most popular or making the best of something? You know? Because, like, there's great examples. So maybe this is a little – taking it a little bit philosophically. But just because something isn't popular doesn't mean it's, you know, bad. Exactly. And in the other case, just because something's popular doesn't mean it's good. And so, you know, I, you have heard John Bellion, one of, like my favorite producer, huge musical inspiration say like, if streams were the equivalent of like excellence, like, well, they're basically saying streams are not the equivalent to excellence because they're giving out streams like candy at Halloween and, and they're giving out plaques for streams, like, because people are just blowing up on TikTok. It's so volume. algorithms are creating volume of streams for songs that are not necessarily like going to, they're not going to be listened to in 15 years. So for him, there's a different version of success that's defined by longevity, depth of art, people's hearts being like really just like, wow, like, like just your emotions and your, your whole like body and mind and heart just being like, wow, this is beautiful. And I'm 
moved by this music, it's and it's that kind of changing. Aesthetic me. transfiction, what we talked about. I, mm. I can't remember what episode. All right, can I? Can I cut in? Let me. Let me try to force you to to do something. <laughs> okay, Great. let's say that you and I right now p- pick up your guitar from the wall and we do a cover of Michael Jackson's Thriller impromptu. We do the best that we can. We record that. Okay. We compare that with any track from The Human Condition from John Bellion. And I say, would you accept the premise that any track would be better than our cover of Thriller impromptu this afternoon? I would imagine you would say yes. yes. <laughs> and so here's my question, Definitely. which I think is going to be a productive conversation. Why? And I think you're getting at this a little bit with this idea of like there's a depth of art, but what's creating that? I think the depth comes from... I think there's probably a lot of different aspects that like talking about that definition of success, let's zoom in on like, what is success in art? Like, for example, I could have a great question, a couple of different goals, like in music production, my goal could be like make money. It could be, um, build a following. It could be impact people's lives. It could be work with specific artists or you could be make the most compelling just amazing sounding thing that i can possibly make and honestly i think the the original reason i started like learning production was because i was like holy crap how do you make a sound like that that sound just changed my life how do i make that sound you know like wanting to basically see you see the movie and you're like i want to make that because it so touched me and uh that kind of is what originally got me into it and so i think that that where i'm feeling this this idea take me is just towards like excellence is something that's worth pursuing on its own in a sense, like making something excellent. There's value just in that quality of something. Sure. Rather than, uh, even if something doesn't have a, um, a return on investment an R yeah, an ROI or a functional, you know, I, I don't use that art on my wall for something but it brings value to my life. Like not all value is tangible. Not all value is like you've mentioned before in an episode, like we're not just going to take food the most pragmatic way, just straight through, uh, straight into our bloodstream or whatever, like energy straight into our bloodstream or caffeine straight into our bloodstream. We're going to drink a nice cup of coffee and enjoy the, the richness of that experience because there's more than just pragmatism to life. Like there's beauty and there's human experiences that, that are of their own value, I guess. Yeah, and you know, to and to kind of bounce to that comparison between us and Bellion again, because yeah. I think you're you're getting at some of these intangible attributes. I think one way that we tell which is better is that it's almost mysterious in a way. Some songs do that to us, right? Some songs, some things we read, they transfix us, they grab us. And so what's really interesting, and this is why I absolutely love what I get to do for a living, is when we read, I'm always challenging my students, okay, you felt moved by this. Mm -hmm. Maybe you felt like, man, this is a beautiful scene. I want to ask you now, what aesthetic features caused you to have this reaction? Why did they use that specific word? Why have a short sentence here? Why describe this instead of something else? And then we can kind of start get in, getting into the technicalities, right? The the elements, the artistic elements. So between us and the John Bellion album, we could talk about the mixing. We could talk about the complexity of the instrumentation. We could talk about the vocal quality. We could talk about the preparedness. We could talk about the balance. We could talk about the harmony. We could talk about the innovativeness. We could talk about the use of, you know, a whole genre in which he is stepping in, right? There's all sorts of things that we could talk about that it's just a funny thing. When we listen to those side by side, we're like, duh, one is better but then it becomes a very interesting question when we say, why is it better? And that's what I wanted to get at with taste okay. today. We, we do those sort of things all the time. We're all the time. When we're revised, we have to say, what's going to make it better? And we do this. We're like, okay, this version of my essay, after I've revised it, it's better. Why? And if you don't really know why, 
it can be hard to get traction with revision. Now, some of it, I think, is unconscious. And this is why I think developing taste involves reading a bunch of stuff or whatever your discipline is. You know, for a novelist, Consuming. you have to consume. Because I think when you consume art, it teaches your unconscious and it does things that we can't quite quantify. We have a sense of, oh, that's a nice paragraph. Why? Well, I could talk about the syntax and the verbs, sure. But there's some sort of recognition that happens that's that's strange. All right, jump in there. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'm just excited. Like, it's just good stuff. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I understand where you're going with this now, and I love it. I think it's the it's moving from this philosophical idea of, like, some art moves you, some art doesn't move you. Yes. Okay, so let's just, being more pragmatic about this, you know, even though I said that pragmatism is not all that matters, like once you find that song that does move you, then you need to, then like practically you just want to, okay, how can I do that with my art? Like I want to be as moving as this other music. How do you do it? And then you, you say, okay, let's, let's pull out the toolkit and find out what tools they used. Cause those tools are how you, we have in music, for example, we have melody, harmony, we have rhythm. You're much more qualified to get this set. I was like mixing. I was no, it's good. Ball. It's good. I mean, that's that's in the list. There's the main things that come into like production that I think about are sound design, the the theory, like the the melody, harmony, the arrangement, so the structure of the song, the you know, there's dynamics, the the kind of journey that you take people on. A lot of people say music is uh and harmony and melody is a journey of taking people on taking people on a journey where you leave home and then you come back home and so that's resolutions that there's resolutions to melodies yes exactly and that's why you hear some songs that's the whole idea of unresolved it's like you left home you never came back home and uh there's there's mixing then there's mastering and then there's how you structure a larger body of work which is interesting to get into and there's so many elements and so that's where i think it's a this is a fun, like I want to get into some of the practicalities of how do you revise and what are those tools that you have to, like we talked about, those are, those are the tools you have inside of like music, for example, to actually move people. But then, you know, like if I pull out my actual toolkit from the closet, I can't just like grab the hammer and start, you know, tapping on a screw. Like I need a screwdriver because you have to use the proper tool at the proper time, in the proper way, for the proper problem. And so that's kind of the whole thing is you have to, when you're working on art, you 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 know kind of constantly as an artist, you know, no, this isn't good enough yet. <laughs> so then you have your problem. This song isn't good enough yet. And you constantly need a solution. Okay, do I need a hammer? Do I need a screwdriver? Do I need a wrench? Like, And that's where I think revision comes into place where you taking it into writing for a second okay, I know this sentence just doesn't feel right yet. And maybe that's just on a gut level or maybe it's feedback from someone else or maybe it's the lack of reaction that I get because I show this to someone and they're being nice to me, but they obviously are not moved by this. And then you have your problem set up. And so then you need to look for the solution, right? Like what tool can I use? How can I rightly apply it so that my art actually has the effect that I want it to have? I mean, is that where you're going with this? Because I'm I'm loving that. Yeah, I think that's exactly where we should dig in. And I'll say one more word about the preference idea. Sometimes, right, these are different questions. So I can prefer to watch Paul Blart Mall Cop and not think it's the best movie that's ever been made. Right? I, I yes. Can, I can think, Guilty pleasures. Right? I it's can think <laughs> that a movie is better than other movies and prefer to watch one than the other. Right? It's not as if they're kind of an either or here. So I, I just wanted to say we mm. can still maintain the idea of preference while simultaneously not entering the place where we only have preference because we can still make an argument that, look, there are aesthetic attributes, there are elements, all of those things that you listed wonderfully, like sound design. These are all things that are helping us think about what can make this piece of art better and i'm so glad that you said it's a it's a formula it's a problem that says here's the issue it needs to change and then the interesting question comes how can i change it 
Yeah. Right? What tool do I need? I think that's a really great way to, to phrase this. There's a this idea in design thinking a lot of design thinking, you know, you don't have to be a like formal designer, illustrator, visual artist in order to do design, right? Design is solving problems. And so in design thinking, they talk about how, you know, we're so quick to be like, okay, I have this problem. And so I have one solution, but good problem solving seeks to define the problem better because uh, what's that famous quote? A problem well understood or well articulated is half solved. There's a quote, something like that, because there's so much, it's almost in line with like, ask me to chop down a tree. I'll spend half the day sharpening the ax. You know what I mean? It's like this idea that really understanding a problem is going to yield more than one solution. And so if we're quick to jump on a solution, like it's, I've seen it on a really practical level in music, like, ah, the song doesn't feel right yet. We need to turn this thing up. We need to turn that up. It needs to hit harder. It needs to be louder. And it's like, it's basically the equivalent of being like, the logo doesn't look good yet. Let's just make it bigger. Let's just make the logo bigger. It's like, that's not the problem. Like maybe we need to refine what is really, okay, this is not having the right effect on us yet. It doesn't look right. Okay, why? Is it the color? Change the color. Nope, still doesn't feel right. Is it the shape? Nope. Okay, is it the textures? Nope. Is it the name itself? Is it the concept? Like there's so many factors at play in every piece of art that if you don't well define your problem, then you're going to just feel disappointed by the solution, you know? All right, let's, let's extend this because I think it's, it's right on. In order to recognize the problem, this is where I see taste intervening. So, for instance, yeah. let's say I sit down to write a novel. I have only read one novel in my life. I can write my novel, and then I say, okay, my novel's not very good. How can I make it better? Here's the problem. The problem is it's not very good. <laughs> right? That's completely vague. It's opaque. I recognize it. But then the question becomes, is it the characterization? Is it the pace? Is it the structure? Is it the subject? All of those questions, I can't see them because I'm not used to seeing them. Now, if I've read 500 novels, it's like you're putting on glasses that help you notice the problem in more detail. So you can see, now you're no longer asking, is it a, you know, is how can I make it better? The problem is that it's bad. No, you can start saying, no, the problem's that I rush this characterization or the problem. And then you can kind of get down into the details. Mm. But my big, and this is a long way to get it, <laughs> getting to my point this episode, but my <laughs> big kind of point that I wanted to talk about today, I think until we cultivate enough experience within our fields, it's very, very hard to be able to recognize what the precise problems are and what the problems require, what tool to use, what the solution would be. And I think by diving deep into our respective fields, you basically you start to recognize things with more resolution and more clarity. And you're able to say, ooh, I saw this in a different work, and that's allowing me to see this in my work. And so I find that taste, when I think about cultivating taste, it's about learning to be concerned with the right problems. Mm -hmm. Or even to recognizing what the exact nature of the problem is, like you said, is half the battle. It's just hard to do that if you don't have experience with what's been done. It's the same way, like if, you know, I had a conversation with my brother-in-law. I was just kind of testing out some of these ideas, and he's big into anime. So shout out to you, Kyle, if you're listening. I hope you're listening. Hey, Kyle. <laughs> I said, it would be difficult to say, you know, is this a good anime show? Or is this a, a really you know, well-done anime show if you've only watched one? Right? You've got this whole sea of different examples and different genres and different purposes. And until you can start to integrate those, it's just hard to say anything about it. The other classic example of this is coffee, right? And wine. Like, you have it's genuine taste, right? You have someone who doesn't really 
care for coffee. And this ties in perfectly with preferences too. There's two thoughts here. So the first thought is if I've never had coffee before and I take a sip, it tastes like motor oil. It's just awful. And then I drink it more and I start to enjoy the caffeine part of it and how it gives me energy. But then I also start to refine, oh, I taste different things. And I've gone to a tasting class before where they've shown the the, the wheel of taste, if you can just Google that, if you haven't seen it before, but it's a really cool, colorful chart that'll show you all the different flavors and these really complicated words like uh, different chocolates and almonds and fruit fruitiness and all these different kind of aspects of, of the taste of coffee. And at first it kind of seems like, what? Like, I'm not going to taste like strawberries in this or whatever the different categories are. And, and then over time you start to refine that palate more. And I assume that the same is similar with wines and different, you know, fine drinks. And it's all this concept of refining your taste. I think it ties in just as well with with music or any other art where at first, if you've never seen a movie and you just watch one, you have no comparison. You have no uh, opportunity to know how this measures up to other things. And then that ties in with preference too, because what's the goal of me drinking that coffee, right? Is the goal to just get caffeinated because I'm really tired. I need to get to work and live my life is the goal because I'm sitting on a Saturday morning at the local coffee shop, enjoying a good book, relaxing, and I want to just savor each sip and really soak in that aesthetic moment. There's different, like there's kind of a validity to both of those. Do I just want to watch a movie for fun or am I looking to really be challenged? Exactly. I think this is great. And you know, another easy, and you already kind of mentioned this with wine, but Working at a distillery, Mm -hmm. I get to sample a lot of our rye whiskeys. And it's interesting how when you taste things back to back, you can tell the difference. So if you tried, we have single barrel whiskeys. If you tried barrel number 59 on Thursday, and then you tried barrel number 68 next Friday, it's going to be really hard to describe them and how they compare to each other. Because for all practical purpose, they taste very, very similar. Now, if you were to get a flight and you take a little sip of one and then a little sip of the other, all of a sudden the difference is right in your face because it's through combination with other things that we begin to see differences. And until you can start to see the differences, it's hard to tell what the problems are, right? And so if we take this back to revision, it's only in understanding a genre that we can start to see difference. And when we start to see difference, that's where we get to see different choices. Then we can recognize, oh, they went for a really rich, ornate language, right? They made a choice here. They, you know, that, I can't really compare that to, to something over here that's very sparse. It's doing something different. But when I bring them together, I can see, oh, there are choices to be made. And then when I look at my work, I can think about now that difference and how it influences how I understand my own work. I just think there's a, we never create in a vacuum. Everything we do, Cormac McCarthy said, books are made out of books, right? Still like an artist, right? We you know, reference that a lot, but they're not. And so I think to be better artists, and I mean that, to be better artists, we need to consume a lot of art. Faulkner's got a great quote. He's like, read everything you possibly can. Read great stuff, read trash. <laughs> he was like, Just bring it in because our minds digest that. And we don't completely understand that, but we start to learn practical things. Yes, like you said, that sound changed my life. I didn't know that was musically possible until I heard it on this track, and it just blows everything up. I didn't know, you know, this style was possible until I found it. So there can be some practicality, but also you just start kind of learning. Like your mind's processing it. And then when you read great work your work starts to sound more like it. It's like if you spend a lot of time with people that, you know, maybe you've got family that uses certain idioms or they're from a certain part of the country. You know, if I spend a lot of time around my grandpa, I'll start to say I reckon a lot more, right? We kind of pick up what we're around in a really, really human way. And so I just, if, we're, if we think about this in regards to coffee and taste, and we think about it in regards to we oftentimes integrate aspects of the community that we're in, why wouldn't we think about it in regards to our art? Wouldn't it work the same way? Mm. There's so many good things. (laughs) 
<laughs> so many good things. I love these ideas. I love what we're saying. It's really encouraging to me because sometimes I feel the pressure to make something incredible and then this pressure to be original. I think we've probably talked about it before, but when you feel yeah. both of those things together, it's like almost this like, I need to just get away from, I need to, you know, low information diet. Like I need to like not consume anything and just go laser focused and create and kind of the idea of like this artist who sneaks away to the cabin and they just create for a year and they like, or like this Eric Clapton gets a guitar and just sneaks away into his bedroom for a year and like comes out like incredible. It's like kind of myth, kind of is it true, sure, you know, whatever. Sure. But this pressure to be original, this pressure to be uninfluenced by other things or not to fall into, oh, he's the the knockoff of this artist. Yes. There's that pressure oh, when because yeah. I'm earlier and younger and, and, and like lack that experience. And so then you feel that pressure and it's like, really encouraging here no like you need to steal like an artist you need to consume a ton of different art so that you can learn from it and def- refine your taste drink a lot of coffee drink richly and and ref- and be very open to the fact that you aren't going to be at the level of someone who has made a thousand songs until you have made maybe 5000 songs like sure. you you have to consume and you have to create. So it kind of actually, that last comment kind of ties in with the question of quality versus quantity mm-hmm. kind of comes into mm-hmm. all this because it's like, okay, should I be just doing tons of quantity consuming and only putting out like a little bit of work or do I need to consume a ton and also create a ton? And maybe how much of what I create do I share? Because we're always going to look back, I think, like a couple years back at our work and be like, oh, that was cringy. That was a little cheesy. It's like, how do you look like even right now? It's like, how will we look back this sure. episode and wish we had said things differently or wish we had sounded different or wished that the direction went a little different. And it's like, how do you live with that while also accepting that there's this journey you have to go on to refine your taste and learn to revise? That's a great question. And, you know, I want to spend a minute here because I wanted to bring us here anyway, and you brought it. If you're skeptical about this whole thing, just think about your own work. We typically have no problem saying, the stuff that I wrote when I was a teenager was not very good. It was objectively, yes, I use the word objectively, worse than what I'm writing now, right? And we can talk about all sorts of different elements and attributes and aesthetic features, but we typically... We have no problem just saying that because we've seen growth in our own craft, right? We all, I mean, if you've been doing your craft a while, you're going to see your craft getting better. And so I love the question of what are the things that help you get better? I mean, they're not self-evident. I think that's what's interesting. You know, it's not just do this. It's sometimes you need to do this and sometimes you don't. You have to know about the context. How do you learn about the different uses of an element in different contexts. Well, you have to read other things, right? I feel like sometimes I'm, you know, I'm getting better because I've read a lot more now as I'm in grad school, but I feel like, okay, maybe in another 20 years when I've read a couple hundred more books that I'll really be ready. And now this can be like giving you paralysis. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. Mm. which is certainly not the case. But I think there's something significant to saying, look, you wouldn't expect to go out and hit a bunch of three-pointers if you've never shot basketball or you've never seen anybody hit a three-pointer, right? There's, it's just, we think about this in every aspect of our life except art. That's literally what I was thinking earlier. Like, if we're talking about starting businesses or being a lawyer... You don't have this expectation to all of a sudden be original and solve a case that no one could solve in a way that no one thought of and do it perfect for performance and, you know, do it without really any other context. No, you have to go read every book you can. You have to study and pass the bar. Like you have to meet these credentials and then you're prepared for those situations, but it's going to be failure and stumbling. And and like, it's so easy to think about in, in these other like more concrete sort of like jobs and things. But then you get into this, like this 
the artsy fartsy just <laughs> feely. I'm sorry, maybe we should cut that. That's regrettable. But yeah, it's just great, though. you get into the if not ethereal. It's what's abstract. the word? Abstract. This abstract. It's world. mysterious. I mean, the, at the beginning of this, I'll just jump in just a second here, but because I want to just pull on this because I think it's important. That beginning thing where you were talking about your heart and your soul and your body come you know, come together and this song just hits you and it grabs you by the scruff. Everyone that you talk to pretty much understands what you mean by this. When you say, I was moved by a song, you're not like, well, could you define that with more quantification? Can, what exactly did you mean? That you had certain neur- neuro signals fired? Like... I, I one time I looked and they don't really understand why goosebumps happen. Now, if if you if this has changed since the last time I've researched it, let me know. But even things like I say I got moved, all of a sudden we're outside of the normal world and we're into something which is the mystery and the intrigue and the part of the beautiful aspect of art. But it's not as natural, and yet we still know what it means to be gripped by something. Mm. So I want to be conscious of our time. I think we should wrap. <laughs> Let's do that. But there's so many things that we could continue to talk about. And I, I feel like this whole episode has almost been a question and, and there's it's there's an, yes. a lack of resolution to this yes. conversation. It needs to be continued because I think we have really established the conversation, but how do you revise like tangibly, you know? Like one example mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for me that I wanted to share really quickly is like, for when I'm working on music, the most practical thing I can do is play the song that I'm mixing and then pause it, open up Spotify, find the reference. I ask every artist I work with to give me a reference track. And there's that tension there. You want to be careful, make sure you don't plagiarize or you know, do that kind of thing, but you want to be inspired and you want to compare to, okay, how does this compare to this? the qualities, the mix, the performance, the instrumentation, the sounds? And that's the quickest way, just A, B, like art that I know is has moved me or the person I'm working with and then showing our art next to it and saying, hmm, this doesn't measure up here. And maybe that even comparison can sometimes practically help me pinpoint the problem because I'm, oh, my vocals are so loud. Their vocals are more cu- quiet. There are practical things you can do through the simple act of comparison. And it's really br- brutal. Like it's such a discouragement to like, play your song and then play that Spotify song and you get really hyped up and you go back and play your song again. And it's like, Oh, it doesn't sound as good, man. It's, it's kind of brutal. But what you just described, I think is developing taste. If you say, I want my coffee to taste like third street coffee. I just made that up. There might be a third street. We're not sponsored by them yet. Uh, (laughs) If I want my coffee to taste like theirs, what do I do? I go to say, I love this coffee, and I say, ooh, it's got hazelnut in it. How can I make, how can I develop those hazelnut notes in my own coffee? Mm. I mean, that's developing taste. Mm. I mean, that's the whole thing, and this is exactly how we work. I, you know, you go to a novelist, and you're like, Cormac McCarthy, man, he's a master. What is he doing? And then you try to integrate some of that into your own work. What You're developing taste. Mm. And so I think the big thing that I wanted to pull up and just, just emphasize in this episode is that we don't just exist in a land of preferences, although there are plenty of preferences that are completely normal and, and justified and all those things, but we also need to cultivate taste. Mm. And as an artist, we don't spend much time anymore talking about, well, you got to cultivate some taste. If you want to make the best reggae album of the year, well, you're going to have to go listen to some reggae, right? You can't just... You can't just airdrop into something and you know what you just can't you have to cultivate taste and so sometimes we we're looking for something practical go read go listen go look at photography that you think is excellent and ask yourself the hard question what elements of design what aesthetic features are making this produce this effect that i can't even understand this is a healthy version of comparison really well said yeah. Well, I think it's time for the quote of the week. So I've got a quote from Sir Roger Scruton, and he's thought a lot about aesthetics and beauty, and I definitely recommend his work. But here's a quote from Scruton. 
Styles may change, details may come and go, but the broad demands of aesthetic judgment are permanent. One of the reasons why I like this quote, we're always asked, or let's just put frame this within our own work, we always are asking in revision, is this working? I think that's the permanent question of aesthetic judgment. We can't get beyond that. We're always going to have to make decisions, right? Styles may change, details may come and go, but we can't escape the question in our own work, is this working? That's, it's inviting us to make a judgment about our work, and we can't escape that as long as we're doing art. Wow. This was a thought-provoking episode for me, honestly. I feel like I need to go 10x my consumption of just good, good art good music, good books, good coffee, good experiences. Is this working? That's it. (laughs) I mean, that's the question of the episode. I think that's a great application to ask ask yourself and also just... And go that step beyond. Is this working? Typically, we're like, nah. Or typically, we're like, (laughs) oh, yeah. Then ask why. That's what I'm always trying to ask myself. Mm -hmm. Why? Why does that work and that doesn't work? Mm Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's a question you can spend your lifetime thinking about. Mm. You know, last thing I'll say is it's kind of funny because I've been listening to some other podcasts and then in listening to them have been seeing, like there was a practical moment this week where I was like, you know, I want to bring a little more energy into the podcast and a little more energy into my demeanor when I talk because I think that that draws people in and that is one of the elements that maybe I can lack because I can be a little more just like reserved and monotone. And just like, I like listening to these podcasts because like the, the hosts just have fun together. Like they're just in a good mood and they're inviting and they're funny. And like, I'm not going to try to be funny. Like, no worries. No, no stress on that part. <laughs> but uh, don't worry. But like, I think there is just that moment of comparison this week of, Oh, maybe I could improve the show this way by just improving the energy I bring in that the demeanor. I can be so focused on what is being said in the content that I forget about the delivery. And so that element of delivery was brought up in my mind this week through the act of comparison and just that revision thinking. So that's a great something summary. that I'm just even thinking in re- like real time right now, how can this podcast be improved by the kind of comparisons to other shows I enjoy? And so, and if you have any feedback on how the podcast could be improved, send us an email at heycraftpodcast at gmail.com. But I think that's, It's a good place to land the plane if you're good. We'll see you all in the next one. Thanks for listening. Hey, thanks for listening to The Craft with Carter and Colby, where we share what we're learning about the creative process. If you're a writer, music producer, marketer, filmmaker, photographer, or you just love creativity, then this show is for you. Our cover art was designed by Elizabeth Newell. You can learn more about her work at elizabethnewelldesign.com. That's Elizabeth n-e-w-e-l-l design.com and you can follow her on instagram at elizabeth is a designer if you like the show there's three things you can do to help us out first subscribe so you learn when we post new episodes second send the link to one of your friends who you think would enjoy the show uh really word of mouth is going to be the the number one way we grow the show in any way and three if you have a topic you want us to cover or feedback about how we can improve the show or comments on what we've said, you can respond to heycraftpodcast at gmail.com, H-E-Y-C-R-A-F-T podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.